えええええなるほどそうですそうですそうですそうですそうですえええええさせぞ OK えさてあいぶえなたんけんパーティシポンいつかたいぶそうですそうですそうですそうですそうですそうですそうです OK だか OK どこオナレフローアンコーイシーシュレダケンえどこえええウシえええええええシュレフロメえウィメエパスケチュエパスケポテトトダパドネそれでは、皆さん、皆さん、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私
about uh, this special topic. This topic, uh, 20 years ago, it was not possible to speak about this because uh, everybody uh, was a consumer in uh, his home uh, without any possibility to produce uh, himself. It was not possible uh, to, uh, uh, to disseminate himself uh, the electricity uh, who was o o obligation to be uh, produced by other people. And now we speak about prosumers, you know. Prosumers, what does it mean? It means people possibly producing their own electricity, generally 100%, 99%, with renewable energy, solar, sometimes wind, sometimes water, and consuming their own producing and sometimes selling it. And this is new and this is a new possibility for the citizen to be involved in their own consumption. Today we have uh, in this uh, European Sustainable Energy Week, uh, a lot of uh, people who knows this, who are involved uh, from different countries, from, uh, uh, from uh, Latvia, from uh, uh, Sp Spain, uh, from Portugal, and these people are going to explain us their own uh, initiative, their own uh, consumption uh, experience, and uh, this will give us different uh, mind to uh, share after this uh, possibility. Nous donnerons ensuite, it's translate, it's translate now? No, oh. I'm the best in English, so I, I follow. We will give first the, uh, the panel the possibility to the floor to the president of uh, European Economic and Social Committee in the, in the 10, mean transport energy section, uh, Ms. Uh, Baiba Miltovic, uh, which come from Latvia, and uh, which is a hard uh, defense of consumer. Baiba, the floor is yours. Yes, I, I hope you can hear me well. Yes, good. So good afternoon, dear ladies and gentlemen, dear experts. I really appreciate your presence. And first of all, I would like to thank the European Commission for accepting our topic, uh, because we represent the House EEFC, Economic and Social Committee, that is umbrella for 329 civil society organizations. And the topic comes from the own initiative of Union with the same title, uh, Energy Self-Consumption as Success Factor of the Ecological Transition. And uh, on this opinion, members are trying to find and feed in uh, their perspective, not only from their national perspective, but also from their civil society organization's perspective. Jean Coulon is my colleague from the same, uh, same organization. Uh, and um, yes, indeed, I represent consumers, consumers nationally, and also deal with the consumer organization. And of course, um, generally speaking, consumers are really uh, appreciating self-consumption uh, both individual collective, there are many good evidences. What we saw after the wars in Ukraine and energy crisis, that it was in many cases even cheaper than the market prices, if we talk about electricity, for example. Uh, and um, there are many uh, beneficial, uh, beneficial elements. Indeed, um, there are many uh, community-led projects, um, and they are instrumental in the local uh, deployment of the renewable energy. And uh, self-consumption is not a new concept. I must say that uh, actually before the war in Ukraine, it was not so much gaining so much popularity than it is now. Uh, now it's more and more developing, and there are many, uh, many models and schemes and member states are trying to de develop even more and more also regulatory framework. And uh, in this regard, there are more initiatives. 
Uh, I would like to remind you that both uh, the Electricity Market Directive and Directive on the promotion of the use of uh, energy from renewable sources introduce this new definition formally recognized as self-consumers, uh, meaning ability to consume, store electricity, and they have produced within their premises and even to sell it. Of course, we know, uh, and since I'm consumer uh, representative, we, we know that there are many obstacles in different member states. They're not the same situation if we talk about uh, in terms of scope. So if we talk about, for example, uh, limited, um, there are limited cases uh, regarding uh, involving uh, involved the use of the public grid uh, system, uh, regarding legal structure, in some cases customers wishing to engage in collective self-consumption need to form a legal entity, so not always uh, this might be also obstacle. Technologies, uh, most uh, member states have chosen to restrict collective self-consumption to renewable energy sources, um, of course, we need to talk about consumer protection, and we heard this morning from the European Commission that this will be the next step if we talk about self-consumption, uh, to establish horizontal protection for the consumers, uh, because definition of self-consumption is um, uh, difficult to establish. You have also uh, some of the businesses, mini business, let's say so, schemes that uh, will be quite difficult to cover under one legislative framework, but it will be next step, and of course we will be happy to, to, to help the Commission with advice from the consumer side. And network charges and taxes, uh, for example, in my country of Latvia, and I'm sure that also some other countries uh, regarding the self-consumption, the very topical issue is about TSO, DSO uh, charges, uh, so tariff increases, and this is not really promoting uh, self uh, self consumption. And um, my advice would be not to go for this kind of increases because this is a time when we need to give really possibility to consumers to install more and more and to be more managing uh, and being able to to manage their energy and produce and also uh, sell it. Um, yes, I think I will stop here to give possibility uh, to other speakers uh, to intervene and also afterwards to give questions and answers uh, session for you. Thanks a lot, Baiba. Uh, now, we, we don't move uh, uh, regarding the, the country because you come from Latvia also and uh, uh, you are Gatisa Bele. Uh, you, are, you were uh, in the field of uh, the ministry. Uh, you were also you were also in the regulatory, and uh, you are not, uh, uh, now you are a consultant in, uh, in regulatory affairs. And uh, please, uh, to give your uh, experience. Thank you, thank you, Chairman. And uh, I, I would like to start, it's, it's really great moment uh, for uh, Europe, uh, for Euro European energy consumers What's happening now is simply amazing. Uh, mostly connected to one technology which is taking over all, all plans. Either you are consumer or generator, policy maker, uh, regulator. Uh, PV, photovoltaic uh, technology is here. All others are calculating and um, uh, basically uh, uh, taking notes, uh, taking uh, in their simulations models what is happening, what will be happening because of uh, this one distinctive technology. And uh, it, we are experien experiencing a really remarkable change in our economic environment. And I would say uh, that mm, solar surge is, uh, is good and it's right and it cuts through you remember the famous saying uh, that uh, finally consumers are giving a real uh, place at the energy market table. And uh, finally there is a pressure on um, a large um, national energy champions, on policy makers and regulators to start at least move 
maintain the same speed as the technology is taking over. Access uh, for self-consumption is very important uh, from consumer perspective as a real hedge for uh, future costs to be able at least partly manage your costs. And it's, it, it, come, it, it became a important number one last year after uh, Russia's war in Ukraine and energy crisis, many consumers were left uh, uh, basically stranded and many consumers re rethought the, the, all the strategy uh, uh, how to behave uh, in, in future. And uh, um, many consumers choose uh, the uh, possibility, the option to uh, produce themselves. And uh, finally, energy became uh, become a uh, uh, an important question for everyone. Uh, before that, it was one of the boring questions. A corporate board means how how long you can discuss about energy when prices are about the same last ten years. Uh, and households, no one cared about the electricity cost. Uh, apart from, of course, vulner vulnerable consumers, and, uh, but in general, that was not a question, uh, and and it became a very important. It it left millions of EU households uh, um, uh, facing uh, quality challenges, and many industries were uh, um, getting hit very hard, and many of the companies are relocating, still relocating outside the EU. And uh, as I said, this self-consumption came right in time. Uh, and there are many challenges uh, self-consumers, potential self-consumers are facing. And uh, the most important, Vibe already mentioned, is network charges. Sometimes self-consumer or consumer in general is paying 10 to 20 times more fixed capital uh, network charge than uh, uh, energy regulator. This is a, um, uh, uh, this came from times when energy uh, uh, production was vertically in, uh, integrated uh, company and it, it is still uh, influencing uh, tariffs. EU Commission, uh, Acer should do more on this. It's uh, uh, for many years, EU Commission is keeping a cap on uh, ESO uh, generation charge, it should be revisited. It should be revisited and rethought uh, in the context of, uh, of today's um, uh, surge of uh, self-consumption and, uh, and possibility to hedge your cost. Another thing is uh, generally uh, uh, extensive cross subsidization. Sometimes self-consumption means a uh, good thing for you and bad thing for your uh, neighbor, uh, which uh, might be a vulner vulnerable consumer, because uh, in some EU member states there is a still uh, network tariff structure, like you are able to free ride because of self consumption. This should be taken into the account, taking knowing this this speedy surge that's happening now, and uh, just a. Um, few uh, sentences about one, several tragic um, uh, things happened last year. Many countries, large consumers, seeing a future prices rising for electricity, were rapidly seeking uh, to invest in self-consumption um, uh, capacity and, uh, and invest in solar uh, panels and parks. Many companies were not able to use a rooftop and were uh, seeking to access the nearby landlocks. Uh, it was most tragic thing that several regulators denied to build the direct line to uh, nearby landlocks just because of uh, present uh, EU um, um, regulatory framework that direct lines uh, are heavily regulated and easily be denied by regulators and system operators. This thing needs to be uh, addressed as well by Euro European Commission. And uh, uh, finally, as con 
consumers, I think we all need the permission comes a little bit lower on um, on um, um, practical level, uh, looking what are the real ba barriers and and wrong signals for uh, consumers and self consumers. Thank you. Thanks to you, uh, dear colleague, dear friend, uh, Gatis. Et maintenant, nous allons passer euh, l'orateur suivant, qui nous vient d'Espagne. Mais il y a aussi des contacts, une expérience euh, au Royaume-Uni, puisque elle est fondatrice d'une communauté d'énergie au Royaume-Uni, et bien qu'elle soit de euh, l'agence espagnole de l'énergie. Donc, euh, nous donnons la parole à Sarah de la Serna. À usted. Thank you. Um, I'm very happy to be here this afternoon, uh, and I'm very pleased that IDAE has been invited to this conversation, and I'm glad to, to be with, with all the colleagues here as well. Um, I would like to um, talk a little bit about um, the area in which I'm, which, which I'm more familiar with, which is um, specifically uh, focusing on uh, self-consumption from the point of view of energy communities. That's the area that I, I'm working most of my time towards. So what I would like to talk about is first very short introduction about the organization in which I'm working at the moment. What is the objective of what I want to talk about today? Uh, a bit of context, because I'm going to talk mainly on the, within the context of, of Spanish um, collective self-consumption and energy communities and some lessons learned. So IDA is a um, public business energy, energy uh, entity that uh, depends on the Ministry of uh, Ecological Transition. And we do um, mainly activity related with uh, policy implementation, management of EU funds, and other technical assistance. So at the moment, uh, most of my time is devoted for this um, management of next generation EU funds. Um, so what is the what I what I want to talk about today? First, to to present energy communities as a new actor of uh, collective self-consumption. I think there are many different actors. So this is one of, of those. Then sharing uh, some lessons learned on collective self-consumption through the experience of energy communities that already resonate with what we are already hearing from, from the previous speakers. And then uh, introducing the contribution of energy communities for the, for the energy transition. And when we were saying as the title of, of this conversation, what is the contribution of self-consumption to the ecological transition, I immediately thought, well, what, what is the um, contribution of um, self-consumption to energy communities, to the social part of the energy transition, which is a, maybe a very specific topic. So starting with the context, um, in Spain, collective self-consumption has evolved um, very widely over the last uh, four or five years. What we have is the opportunity to, to share uh, energy uh, wide over that, more over than a building. You can um, connect uh, the generation plant and a consumer um, un until very recently it was 500 meters radius from uh, generator to cons consumption point and now it's over to uh, two kilometers. So there is a wide scope already for doing collective self-consumption, although numbers tell us that uh, it's only a very, very small number of the installations of self-consumption that are actually collective. Most of them are self-consumption, individual self-consumption. So that's the concept, very, very brief on, on Spanish self-consumption. The other topic is energy communities. Very briefly, I don't know how many people in the audience will be familiar with this concept. Um, I think it has a lot to do with the social part of the energy transition. Um, energy communities is all about governance, I believe. It's about defining what is that concept as a legal entity. It, it has a special point that the government governance sits within citizens, SMEs, uh, local authorities and hence um, that area of let's try to engage actors that have been not traditionally engaged within this uh, movement. So this is probably a very bad equation, but I thought that this was going to be helpful for today. I see myself um, 
energy consumity uh, energy community as um, collective self-consumption, other related activities because they do much more than um, uh, photovoltaics, they do heating, um, energy efficiency, other energy related activities. And then this social dimension that I was mentioning about the how is the governance uh, for all of these schemes, um, there are elements related with the education, um, energy poverty, etc. So the areas in which I'm going to focus a little bit more today are this collective self-consumption and as well that social dimension. More context on what we've done um, and uh, where, are, where have we extracted these lessons learned. So we have uh, from Next Generation EU, we've developed a framework of three steps in order to develop energy communities. We've called it Aprende, Planifica, Implementa. The last one is the one that I'm going to focus on, implementation. It's an area that there is some funding uh, going towards the investment on assets, energy assets for energy communities. Uh, we've done four calls for this. Um, they have been, um, this, uh, we have uh, the results of uh, the first and the second call, and they, um, they were four million of support and 90 million investment. So we, we are starting to have data from 74 projects, which all of them have um, hundreds of measures, more than 700. They all, the, the members of these 74 projects are almost 100,000. SMEs, citizens, and local entities, mainly uh, persons. Um, and then 41% of the projects um, were going over and beyond um, collective self-consumption uh, from solar panels to include other measures. Uh, specifically, um, there was a lot of um, sustainable mobility, um, electric vehicles and electric vehicle infrastructure, and as well, the mine science response, which uh, I, well, I think connects very well with the electrical part of, of the energy transition. So more elements, who are these actors and what we are seeing from, from the reality. So these new actors for collective self-consumption, we see that as I was uh, showing now, they engage in pretty much the whole um, energy transition from electric to energy efficiency to electric mobility. They are cross-cutting because uh, it's quite interesting they, and this uh, is linked with the social part of the energy transition. They not, not only engage on uh, implementing a physical asset solar panels, but also they engage in educational projects and they have other activities in their communities. And they are very, there is a wide innovation within this. Um, and they have different roles of the different um, activities that we are seeing. Local entities are very important for the promotion of, the, of this project. Citizens, specialists are starting to, to become engaged in these kind of projects. Uh, so now um, coming um, to having this context, um, let's have a look of what are some of the lessons that we are seeing from this small range, but it's uh, significant of, uh, because it's very representative of collective self-consumption. As we were hearing before, uh, just before even going to the production of the plants and having some of the barriers of, of the charges that you've heard before, it's been very difficult. Um, uh, there are many delays on granting access and connection to the distribution network uh, specifically. So from the smaller projects, we have 45 uh, small projects. One in two projects have delays on, for just for this. So it's a big challenge. And this comes together with the fact that some of these uh, small projects, um, sometimes they are not actors that are usually engaging with the energy sector, so they have a further barrier. Um, another uh, barrier is the point that uh, at, as this is collective self-consumption, they tend to use, or at least we've seen this within the projects, uh, public spaces. And there's a huge problem uh, as well on delays on leasing those spaces because there is no familiarity with these new figures. Um, as well, some supply chain issues from transformers, lead times, or some urban permitting issues. So um, very few pointers, and I'm finishing now, on what is the added value of these actors of the energy communities. Um, very important for as an energy, as an engagement tool. Um, we've seen um, 74 projects, almost 100,000 people. They, they move people, they engage them, they have to make decisions within their communities. Um, very geographically spread, we see that one in two energy communities are in locations of less than 5,000 inhabitants, so in Spain at least it's, it's quite prevalent there. And then the distribution of benefits, um, they involve um, uh, consumers in energy poverty that uh, potentially wouldn't be involved in other traditional collective self-consumption schemes. 
And the theme is now just some uh, next steps, um, this unlocking of the access and connection process, very important. Um, some uh, assistance maybe for this action specifically, one-stop shops, and then very important to, to share knowledge through a network of, uh, of, of experience. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias usted. Thank you very much. We're now going to give the floor and we're going to leave Spain and, uh, to go west and we're going to go to Lisbon University and we're going to have uh, Miguel Macias Segueira. Advisory hub, is it? Uh, yes, please. Yes, go ahead. Merci. Uh, so, good afternoon to all. Uh, my name is Miguel, uh, and I'm going to present a bit of the work of the Energy Poverty Advisory Hub in an actual case study of an energy community in Lisbon, uh, Portugal. So, the EPA is the main uh, uh, initiative from the European Commission on Energy Poverty, and one of its main components is the technical assistance. So in the first call, uh, 39 municipalities all over Europe were selected for technical assistance for local actions to combat energy poverty. And in the second call, after uh, also 49 municipalities. Uh, the one that I'm going to speak about is one of two in Portugal from the first call in the Lumiar civil parish, so a part of Lisbon. And one of the things that we started with in EPA was why support an energy community in Portugal, why it makes sense. So in Portugal, this concept is quite new. Uh, most projects, we saw the, the law in Spain, in Portugal, the law also transposed from the directive, but it also includes the large companies. So large companies can control energy communities. And what we are seeing is that they are, in fact, creating most energy communities, and they are not actively involving citizens. And as well, because these are commercial projects with uh, financial profits uh, above all, energy poverty mitigation becomes a bit diluted. And we, at EPA, we saw that the full potential of energy communities might be lost in the Portuguese context, and in here, all the benefits that we saw, not only climate, environmental, economic, social, but also governance, also about energy democracy of people participating in these kind of projects. So from uh, October 22 to July 2033, so it's uh, ending next month, the Energy Poverty Advisory Hub is giving support to Lumiar, the civil parish, the local government, and uh, to the local partnership of Tulheres, which is a, a network of associations from these neighborhoods. Also with the expertise of Copernico, a renewable energy cooperative, and uh, the support of the SENS FCT Nova, the University of Lisbon. And with this concrete goal of being uh, one of the first citizen-led and inclusive energy communities in Portugal, also tackling energy poverty and promoting energy democracy. So to produce a project and an approach that is replicable, uh, that it's a bit different from what's being done in Portugal. Uh, the first step was to conduct uh, energy poverty diagnosis. So looking at indicators related to income, to social vulnerability, to buildings energy efficiency, to understand where in Lisbon people are actually vulnerable to energy poverty in winter, uh, the red one, and in summer, the, the blue one. And we see that in the historical parts of Lisbon, the vulnerability is normally higher because of buildings that uh, have uh, poor standards. And in uh, Tulheres, in Lumiar civil parish, uh, we first also selected buildings to implement the energy community. And in this case, the pilot project in this specific building, a quite small project just to test the approach with uh, 17 participants. So here, the local government as one of the participants 13 families that sign up for the project, and this was last month, we had people sign up for the project, and actually the 13 spots filled in 13 minutes. So we had a lot of interest from people in the neighborhoods. And here the component about social inclusion, uh, where three families that normally will not join this kind of project because they cannot make the investment, will also be included in the project. And here also with the two kilometer ra radius uh, where people can join the energy community. So we had to, de to develop uh, a financial and operation model from scratch in Portugal based on a non-profit association where very shortly people invest a fixed amount to join the energy community 
uh, and then uh, the association buys the solar PV system to install in that building, while the social participants do not pay the, their entry, which is uh, paid by for the Lumiar civil parish and by the other participants. Uh, then, as these people already paid for the electricity, they have the right to use their share of electricity of the PV system for as long as the PV system works, and they only have to pay an annual maintenance fee to cover the cost of maintenance, insurance, and tariffs, and this allows the system to continue to work and allows the people to belong to the association and to have a, a voting rights. It's also possible in this case to sell the surplus. Uh, then we also had to define the regulation, so the rules for this to work in practice. As I said, the legal entity in this case is, is a non-profit association, so it's a purely non-profit and volunteer work project. Then we had to define internal regulations, so who are the members, uh, what are the conditions to join, if they want to leave, how they leave. Uh, here about also consum consumer protection it's relevant to consider what happens if people leave a project that they already joined and paid for, uh, for entry. How is the electricity shared? This payment of the annual quota, the sale of surplus electricity, and also here the meetings decision making where all participants have equal voting rights. So each participant one vote, quite straightforward. Since the beginning, this has been a project developed with the community. So the original idea in 2020 appeared from those post-its in the picture on the left, and it has been an open participation. So this is a volunteer group where people participate in the meetings and they can join if they, they want, they can leave the group as well if they want. Uh, and we also try to always be present in the community, in festivals, local music festivals, for example, to spread the message, to tell the community that this was happening. And uh, recently, we also had a more formal section with the present of the civil parish with a uh, uh, representative also of the of Copernic to in invite people to join the project and we produced a easy to read informative guide to tell the people the information that I shared with you. Uh, and really here also a, a big role of word of mouth at uh, the local scale uh, where people know each other and can share the, this, uh, this idea and this project. Uh, also, uh, identify and engaging energy poor families. So in here, the approach is a bit different. We have to go through the social support services that already exist, in which people already trust. And uh, they, these people, these families, also have an active decision to join the energy community. So they have equal voting rights, so they are full members, even if they don't pay for, uh, for their entry because they are not able to. So it also promotes social inclusion some learnings from this process. So we see that in Portugal and maybe in other countries, there are uh, weak social movements, so it's difficult for people to join and start building something like this. Also, most people are volunteers, so this is done on free time. And also, energy literacy is uh, generally low. We also see that there is, there is insufficient information and lack of techni technical no knowledge. And in this project, we saw the importance of having a uh, uh, local support, uh, local technical support. There's also financing difficulties, and in here it's quite important to have dedicated financing for non-profit energy communities to be able to uh, take off. And we are now entering this phase of the licensing, and in Portugal, I don't know how it is in other countries, but it's a slow process that takes months to obtain a license to start the project, so people join and then have to wait maybe six, seven, eight months before they are approved. So it's a long process that people might lose interest. So what uh, we have seen from this technical assist assistance of EPA is that really without this targeted support, uh, cities and led energy communities will not just spontaneously generate. So we need more activities as this technical assistance of EPA, where experts can go to the communities, to the local governments, and support them in these actions that are quite relevant for a uh, energy poverty mitigation and for uh, climate change mitigation. And in this photo you see the current, uh, some of the current members that are already really starting this process of community building and energy community building. Thank you. Muito obrigado. Merci beaucoup. Thanks a lot. Uh, we are going to give now the floor 
to Cecilia. Eh? Yeah. If I'm Cecilia, uh, she has a word. No home without energy. Is it true? This is our problem. It's yes. your, uh, it's, it's your uh, way of life, no? <laughs> yeah. Please to explain us. No, no home without energy is our program. It's one of the programs that um, we manage in the energy and people uh, department. And is uh, the name of the project explain our objective. That is no home without energy. And part of this uh, project is uh, energy communities. So. Please go ahead. So thanks a lot for inviting to explain ECODES program to foster energy communities. Uh, ECODES is an NGO in Spain, and I'm going to reinforce the message that uh, Sara and Miguel uh, have had explained, because more or less our barriers and our uh, learning lessons are the same. Uh, we are aspiring a paradigm shift in the energy model. We are moving from a rigid and centralized model to a flexible, renewable, and decentralized model where citizens are in the center, in the center as active participants. But as uh, Miguel said, the, this paradigm, paradigm shift in the energy requires a paradigm shift in citizen participation, because in Spain, only 12% of citizens are associated and only 7% actively participate in tax for the benefits of the community. So, ECODES uh, Energy Community Program try to activate these citizens, try to promote the participant of citizens in the transition to uh, the new energy model in people's hands, what is important, and leaves no one behind. Our specific objectives are decarbonization of the energy model, empowering people to manage energy, involving people in energy poverty in the change of the model. Why? Because in 2013, 10 years ago, we started to, to, to develop our No Home Without Energy program, and we realized that energy communities could be a solution for uh, energy poverty. But also, our program tried to tackle demographic challenge. is quite important in, in Spain, because rural areas don't have population. Uh, we aim also building community at local level, sense of belonging, and of course, promoting distributed energy system. Our work working lines are four. First one is what Miguel explained. We are on the ground. We are as technical experts. We, uh, we boast and support uh, the creation of energy communities in uh, small towns, also in urban areas. Then uh, we try to develop social innovation projects about energy communities to go beyond the frontiers, to know new ideas, to, to test new ideas. The second line is for us is very important to uh, create networks to exchange and uh, transfer knowledge to foster energy communities. We want to prevent of each community from inventing the wheel because sometimes one uh, town, uh, one group of people in the north of Spain is thinking, how can I do my energy community? And this uh, question is also the same question in some place, for example, in the south of Spain. And finally, with all of the learning lessons on the ground and working with people, we try to do advocacy in order to achieve uh, a specific framework for energy communities to be a real player in the energy market and also to have ambitious law that put energy, energy communities in the, in the center. What is an energy community? Sarah has explained, and uh, is about self-consumption or not? Well, what are the difference between uh, energy solar co collective self-consumption and energy communities? For us, uh, the, the title of the session is self-consumption, but there are differences, very important differences. First one is energy, so energy solar collective self-consumption is about uh, kilowatts. It has to do with a technical installation and with energy. And it's a modality of circumstances in the Spanish regulation. But energy communities is something uh, about people. It's uh, how people organize themselves, 
people, administration, local authorities, and SMEs, how they can organize themselves to carry out common projects, not, not only in renewable energy or solar energy, also uh, in projects like uh, building renovation or electric car sailing. And it's a legal entity. For us, uh, it's an opportunity for towns to lead the change of energy model and also to create a space of, for dialogue around the natural resources to who we have in our environment to produce energy. And how to create an energy community? Uh, we develop this roadmap. With this roadmap, we help a small towns and group of citizens that we want to create an um, energy community. Um, Gail has explained in detail most of the steps that we, we follow. The first one is uh, related, in, in that case, is true that uh, energy community is not self-consumption, but many times the first uh, project that an uh, energy community thinks is self-consumption because it's the easiest and the most known. So at the beginning, we try to uh, analyze the PV potential of the most suitable uh, roofs and land for a collective cell consumption in order to know how many people can participate in the energy community. Then it's crucial the informative and participatory processes. It's very important to, to develop a communication uh, campaign in order to encourage people to participate in the, in the com energy community. And for that, it's very important to, have a, to create a driving group of people that they spread the word among their neighbors, their friends, and they act as dynamizers. Then, when we have people, we have to collect the, the data because it's very important to invite all of uh, interested people to participate in the co-creation workshops in order to define what uh, Miguel said, the, the legal statutes, internal regulation, funding, constitution of EC, and when these things are clear, the internal regulation and so on, we are already an energy community. It's important to define together the economic model, definition of the funding of the energy community, how, um, how many the members are going to invest. Of course, if the, if the roof are from the municipality, some, someone explained, it's very important uh, to develop how the municipal is going to allow to the energy community use their spaces. And at the end, we implement the photovoltaic installation. So only speak about technical issues at the end of the processes, at the end of the roadmap. It's very important that roadmap for creating an energy community is something related to people. Uh, thanks of this roadmap, we, we help to create 12 energy communities in the north of Spain in, two, in 2020. And it's very important that uh, Pioneers lead the energy transition. You can see uh, uh, in the north of Spain, in the Pyrenees, start uh, our first energy community. And then uh, it sowed the seed uh, to create a contagion effect in the nearby towns. And now the energy community's movement is going down for the, our region. So this is very, very important. And also we develop social innovation projects to test new alternatives, a uh, pilot project to see if energy communities can solve this kind of, pro uh, of problems or challenges, take energy poverty, foster rural development, boost citizen participation, and also promote green jobs. One example is Barrio Solar. It's an urban solar community. It consists in of two collective cell consumption installations locate, located in uh, two sport facilities from the municipality. It was difficult to get the permission to put the installation there, one of the barriers that uh, Sarah mentioned. And uh, 200 household and business participate by self-consumption solar energy. To, uh, 20 are vulnerable household and they participate for free because the rest of the people assume the part of the money that this vulnerable household should uh, put. ECODES is the coordinator, and uh, we collaborate with a power company, EDP, and the Zaragoza City, City Council also participate. Um, and now we are starting a new project. It's called La Energía del Barrio. In this case, uh, we wanted to involve vulnerable families in a disadvantaged neighborhood in the change of energy model through the creation of an energy community, but also a learning community. 
Miguel has uh, told about energy literacy, that is very important. Energy communities uh, is an opportunity also to increase this energy literacy from the people. So this project has uh, three main activities. One of them is collective cell consumption, an installation of a solar installation in a church. That is quite different because church is the center of the social activity in this disadvantaged neighborhood. Uh, 60 vulnerable families are going to participate in the cell consumption, but a part of the installation, we are going to develop a support and learning processes. D during one year, we are going to train vulnerable people in order to learn how uh, to improve their energy consumption habits, uh, how they can manage with their energy bills, uh, how can they go to uh, ask for their uh, energy rights from the energy companies. And at the, at the end, the last, the last activity is an energy office. It's an energy office open to all of the neighborhoods, not only the family that participate in the cell consumption, because for us, it's very important that the energy literacy spread around the neighborhood, and uh, it could be the seed to promote cell consumption individual, other energy, in the other energy communities in the, in the neighborhood, and also uh, electric car saving project or building renovation together. Thanks a lot. Bravo. So what a new world. Energy communities, new producers, new consumers, increased renewable energy, these are new challenges for distribution operators. So we are very happy to, to see uh, Mr. Mohamed Lajibi, which comes from France and which is in charge in the operator, the, the, the only one operator, distribution operator in France uh, about the energy transition solutions. So uh, re regarding uh, all these new projects, all these new challenges, what is your view? And uh, please uh, take the floor. Thank you, Pierre-Jean. So yeah, I'm delighted to, to share Enedis and my views regarding these energy communities that we have in France, and uh, more particularly about self-consumption and also the, the collective self-consumption scheme that we have uh, in practice in France. So that what I would like to take you through this session is first uh, basic knowledge about individual self-consumption and the way it is skyrocketing at the moment uh, in France. How we move, not only move, but we, uh, we have uh, added the collective self-consumption in our regulatory framework and how we managed to do that. And finally finish with the energy communities and how we tackle this uh, growing issue at the moment uh, at Nedis. So first, about the individual consumption, you can see uh, on the graph that there is a, an exponential uh, growth of um, local generation that are being connected to the grid. You can see that as of uh, quarter one uh, 2023, we have 1.3 gigawatts, 1.3 gigawatts. This is a huge, huge amount. And only in 2022, we had one point, uh, 0 0.5 gigawatts that were connected to the grid. So these are great figures. This is a big, sorry, <coughs> this is a big challenge for us because we have to, um, to match these expectations with our human resources and also the IT tools in order to, to cope with these uh, big uh, needs and uh, expectations from, the, from people. So this is the self-consumption word. Um, one thing I would like to add is about the, the grid tariff, because sometimes you will hear, uh, I don't know in other countries, but maybe in France, that self-consumption costs more than just uh, being connected to the grid. This is, from one point of view, true, because you will be connected to the grid, so in this way you will have to use the grid, so you will pay your cables and so on to be connected. But in the other hand, if you were to analyze the costs of being just consumer or being just producer in France, when you're a self-consumer, you will pay less grid tariff. So the management fee will be lower than if you were just producer or just consumer. So this is a, a true fact that we need to, to highlight 
any time we, we talk about uh, energy self-consumption. So we have the self-consumption that is a big trend that is strengthening. We have lots of uh, demand in France. So this is the from the, the self the, the left uh, part thing you can see on the slide. But then um, we are witnessing a new phenomenon that is called collective self-consumption, which is a way for several sites geographical, geographically distant uh, to share their electricity at a local scale thanks to the public grid. And we would like to highlight this thanks to the public grid because if you want to share electricity, it is not a matter of just installing cables and being ready to, to share your electricity because, for example, you, if you are 20 kilometers away from your neighbor, you will not create um, you know, a parallel network to, in order to cope with this, uh, this need. So we make the most of the public grid in order to share the electricity, and this is made through a system that was put in place in France since 20, 2018, and that is more and more mature now uh, at the moment and I will uh, go through now. So just a quick uh, energy sharing pro process in France in order to better understand how you can save money on your electricity bill, an electricity bill because it is the duty of this session is how to alleviate um, the power of the markets on the final bill of the customer. So first, look at the energy sharing process in France. You will have several clients, one client one, client two, client three, and a PV generator. They will be gathered through a legal entity that is called the PMO, that is mandatory in order to launch a CSC operation, so CSC is collective self-consumption operation in France. So they are all gathered and they can share the electricity thanks to smart meters that you can see for C1, C2, and C3. They all have their own supplier. And this is really important because uh, we are free to select our supplier. We we all know that intermittency of energy will not allow you to be uh, perfectly autonomous in terms of energy, so you still need this supplier, and this is a common rule even in collective self-consumption that any customer has the right to select the, the supplier he wants. So in terms of basic process um, steps, so you have first the load curves uh, measurement that is, that is made by the, the DSO, so you will look at the consumption on the meter for client one, client two, client three, and also for the PV generation. This is 99% of the time. Then we will collect the distribution keys of the PMO, so the legal entity that gathers all the participants. We will apply this distribution keys in order to evaluate the self-consumption part, that is a self-consumption based on contractual repartition between the participants. We will assess also the, uh, the part that is coming from the supplier. So this is the, the blue part that you can see on the, on the picture. And finally, we will release all these data to the CSC stakeholders. So you have basically the PMO, so the legal entity, you have the balanced responsible entities, you have the suppliers, and also the producers. So each of these members will have all the information that comes from the CSC operations. And how will, be this, or how will it be illustrated on the final customer bill? So again, customer three with 90 kilowatt hour of total consumption at the meter. You will have two parts. One part coming from the energy sharing system, that is the first with 40 kilowatt hours. And one part, one part coming from the supplier this is the 50 kilowatt hour parts. And these two uh, parts are calculated by the DSO. So our role is central, instrumental in the CSC operations. And we like to add that if you were to save money on your electricity bill, it's just by saying, okay, I'm part of the CSC operation, I save money. This is not true because sometimes the energy sharing part that will be sold within the operation might be higher than the price that will be given by your own supplier. So it will be very recommended to look at the conditions you share electricity in order not to be um, you know, disappointed by the, by the fact that you are part of this uh, energy community. 
looking at the key figures as of May 2023 in France, so I told you we, we have begun in 2018. You can see on, the, on this curve that we have a steadily growth. And in 2021, we've witnessed a significant increase in the number of CSC operations. So now we have more than 200 active operations. You could tell me that it's, how does it, how is it possible? I would say that first, the energy crisis. So people were more and more uh, aware of the fact that they can save money by self-consuming, which was not easy uh, at the beginning to understand because it was just, you know, a, a kind of ecological uh, awareness at the at front. Uh, afterwards, we have also the, the costs of uh, the PV panels that are, you know, going down and uh, letting people invest more in these uh, installations. We have the regulatory framework in France. So it was first a technical sharing, you know, between uh, members behind the same substation. And with time, we have extended to a ge geographical area uh, possibility for all these participants. And now we are opening up to incentives for, this, uh, for the producers in order to be part also of this energy sharing system. So people are getting more and more engaged in this uh, CSC uh, model. It is quite trendy at the moment because people want to, to pay less. So anyone wants to, <laughs> to pay less on his final bill, but it's, it is even more true in this context of energy crisis. Looking at the types of legal entities, you could see that the, you know, the PMO that we have in France was mainly uh, composed of local authorities at first because it was easy for them to launch the operation. But with the energy crisis, we're all seeing that even more citizens, large companies, and also small and medium companies are interested in CSC uh, operations and the fruit that they can benefit from all this participation. And the final part that is so much, so much important is the way that, okay, uh, CSC is disturbing the business of the supplier. It has to be said because it's really difficult for them to, uh, to have the prediction on how the co their co customer will consume when they have a share energy shared part to take, uh, account, take into account. So suppliers are working a lot uh, in order to integrate the deduction of electricity coming from the energy sharing system. This is not as easy as everyone will think at first because they have to modify their information systems in order to integrate these local parts. It's a, at the moment, let's say, a barrier of the development because it's tough for them, but they're working a lot. We also at Enedis are sending the data from an industrial point of view, from the IS systems, in order to allow them to, to do the job properly. And uh, we, uh, we are talking a lot with the suppliers because basically they are also partners of the DSOs uh, in any countries uh, in Europe. And they are thinking about, you know, really integrating all these aspects of energy sharing, but also proposing um, electricity offers accordingly to these expectations of people because anyone wants to consume locally. So suppliers, they just gather electricity coming from both the market or their own generation uh, assets. So they are you know, proposing electricity offers, local electricity offers that might um, match the expectations of the customers. And this is a trend that is not going to, to stop. And just to, to finish about the energy communities, because we were speaking about collective self-consumption, that is a part, a good part, that we manage uh, at Energis. But we also have the energy communities that we, had, well, that, that we talked before, the energy, uh, the, the citizen or the renewables. Uh, I will not dig into, you know, the precisions of, you know, uh, uh, citizen, citizen or renewables. Just to, to bear in mind that in France, these uh, energy communities were transposed in the French Energy Code. It was in 2021. We still uh, were still waiting for the application decree that will uh, allow uh, people to really uh, launch on the field these uh, energy communities. But some key findings that has to be uh, highlighted regarding this energy community is that first, um, it is a kind of uh, legal vehicle for projects. Energy communities were existing before. We, we could uh, invest with an association of citizens in order to 
produce and share our electricity. This is not new. The fact that is new is the, the way that all these energy communities can act as real player on the energy market that was not being possible before. They can be, uh, they can be uh, balance responsible entities, they can uh, supply, they can share, they can do a lot more than just you know, association that were ready to, to share their, to produce and sell their electricity before. So this is for uh, citizen energy communities. And moreover, um, we have the, the conviction that the collective self-consumption is key for these energy communities because the, f the first thing that they will do is just to share their electricity at first and then to think about how you can um, look at flexibility or EV charging systems, uh, services, and, and so on. So. First, collective self-consumption for them. So we expect a lot more uh, operation coming for, uh, for Enedis. But also for us, because we are partners of local authorities, we can see that they will need some training, not training, but I will see pedagogy, communication, in order to better understand what is an energy community. Because most of the time, the people don't understand um, the complexity of an energy market. So this is key for us as a, you know, uh, an actor that help out the energy transition in France. Thank you. Merci, thank you. So, new world. Uh, now we have a, a, a few minutes uh, for you, for the room, if you have uh, any question, please uh, not to give large developments, uh, but to ask questions to panelists or to give a very precise experience. Anyone? Question? It was clear? You know everything about this? So, if no question, I would like to no problem. I would like, uh, please, uh, to give again the floor to the panelists, three minutes each, to, to give us your reaction to the other panelists. You hear from the panelists, and maybe, sure, you have some ideas, new or uh, development, necess necessary uh, development, if possible. And I will, uh, if you accept, I will uh, uh, give the floor, beginning by the end. Mohamed. OK, that's fine. Thank you, Pierre-Jean. Um, regarding the previous presentation, what I, um, what I bear in mind is the, um, the social uh, solidarity that you would like to implement thanks to energy communities, that you, you talk to this in Portugal, in Spain as well. And I think this is um, a key trend at the moment, because even in France, we have some regulatory framework that is um, facilitating, for example, social landlords to be a legal entity of CSC operations. So this is a way to integrate you know, people that are subject to, to difficulties regarding their, their, finan their, their finance, and to be part of a scheme that will allow them to lower, lower their energy bill. So I think that the, the social aspects of the synergy communities are really important. So this is uh, the, the first part. The second part is also our understanding of the energy communities, because um, people most of the time mix energy community and colossal self-consumption. And I'm pretty uh, happy to, <laughs> to hear that this is not the, 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 the thing that is coming out of uh, the, this session and is a common shared knowledge that we have in uh, all uh, countries in, in Europe, and this is really important in order to, you know, to, to progress and to keep the pace with the expectations of the, of the citizens. And finally, uh, working about the regulatory uh, framework that we, we talked before, the market design is something that, is <laughs> that we expect, but we expect and we look at this really thoroughly because we are, uh, the market design shouldn't be a reason why uh, people will uh, prevent from uh, being connected to the network or uh, keeping a contract with a supplier or keeping a contract with the DSO. We need to keep uh, the public grid uh, central in this, uh, in this matters. 
peer-to-peer -peer trading is, uh, is a trending uh, opportunity for people, but from uh, a DSO point of view, we think that we, we need to, to keep the, you know, the, the pillars of the electric system. And as pillars, we have uh, lots of constraints and obligations that are uh, under the, the suppliers. And we shouldn't in introduce any distortion to the, to the competition that will be made possible thanks to a market design that is too in favor of this, um, this peer to peer trading. So we're looking at the, the market and look at it and uh, think about how we can uh, be part of it. Merci. Um, Cecilia. Thank you, Cecilia. Uh, one thing that some of the panelists uh, have uh, said is uh, related to the difficulties to connect one self-consumption installation to the distribution system. Because this, uh, most of us, Miguel or my colleague and me, try to encourage people to be part of an energy community. And at the end, they, are, they wanted to self-consumption with the first project, but it takes so many time to get the, um, the connection to the grid from the distributed, that at the end, people is frustrated. So all of the work that we do, put uh, in, in activity in people, put in, in encourage people, and when they are on fire, we can say, then it takes six months, even one year, to see the cell consumption running out. So this is quite important. And in some, uh, and also the, the colleague from Latvia said about the, the prices. So I think we should do something in a European and national level to push distributed companies in order to accelerate the connection of cell consumption. Thanks a lot. Uh, muchas gracias, Cecilia. Uh, Miguel? Uh, so, first of all, I really enjoyed the, the other presentations from Spain and, and uh, France, but I enjoyed them at the same time they made them, me uh, a bit sad about the situation in Portugal. So, we see that in France, the, they have uh, this database of energy communities with all this public information, right? In Portugal, we don't have this information. So, in the uh, end of December, there were three projects last year, there were three projects licensed, and I know this information because in a newspaper they asked the, the competent authority and they answered and it was in the news. But there is not this public information about the projects, the type of projects. Uh, also, uh, this, this distinction about uh, renewable energy communities and collective self-consumption in Portugal, it, uh, it is used the same. So we see virtually all projects, they are collective self-consumption but when they publish themselves, they publish themselves as energy communities because it's more of a buzzword, it sounds better. So I, I think this distinction is really important to, to make uh, because also in the Spanish case, we saw that uh, really the so social component, it's uh, a concern in a lot of projects. And uh, while we see that in Portugal, normally this social component is translated as a discount in the invoice. So it's not about social participation, it's not about uh, people um, being empowered, it's not about energy poverty, it's a discount that is not even clear what is the discount because it's 10% against the prices on the market, but which market? So I thought it was really interesting to, to know the other experiences here. And also, for example, just a, a, a very maybe silly example in the French case, you have in your energy bill a separation between what you use from the, uh, the retailer and from the energy community. In Portugal so far, you don't see what you use from the energy community. So you don't even know what you are saving. And in other cases, if you sign a contract with one of these energy communities companies, you get a separate invoice. So instead <coughs> of one, you have two and you have to pay two invoices. So. I feel that it could be made uh, a lot easier in Portugal and we can learn for sure from uh, the, the experiences. Muito obrigado, Miguel. Uh, Sara. Yeah, so I think uh, a reaction to the reaction, the grass is always greener on the other side. 
So I'm sure we also think that why from Portugal or from France, there are always things to, to take from other places. And we have actually been looking at some things on regulation on Portugal who are quite okay. So I think that's uh, an encouraging message. And then on the thing that I think we are commenting, all of us on the um, confusion on collective self-consumption and energy communities, I think this is because this is new and as well is because I think at the moment um, we don't really understand very well um, what, are, what is the added value of an energy community on a very, very tangible way. And this is because a lot of the benefits are social and hence these are not numbers and it's much more difficult to translate. So I think this framework is evolving in some countries. I think they have a, a in which um, this kind of association and some uh, corporativism is there. They, they, but I think we need more time to, to put that on the table and say, well, actually, this is the added value of, of one actor versus the other. And this is, I think, narrowly connected with and hence because of this added value and because of the characteristics of these energy communities, the regulatory frameworks should give a push to these actors because otherwise they wouldn't prosper and we will not have the added value. That, but, uh, but everything is, is very new, so that's why we are working on these, these pilots and well, let's get some data and let's understand it, but I think that's, that's very, very important. That's uh, maybe one of the, the points and maybe another thing to highlight that I think has been very clear, but I, it makes me think a lot no, when I work on energy communities is that we are talking about the added value, but as well is, well, what will be missed out if these figures don't prosper? Well, uh, they are, they have some elements important, such as uh, addressing um, uh, energy poverty, you know? And this, by nature, won't be a commercial product. Uh, and then is why it's so important, again, all this network of, well, this is another value, this is why you should give some push, some regulation towards that. And, that's maybe some, some comments that as well came from, from it. Muchas gracias, Sara. Gatis? Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm taking from this uh, panel uh, several things. Uh, one thing is uh, uh, there are several really amazing cases uh, around the Europe uh, with uh, um, um, collective self-consuming self and uh, energy community uh, projects uh, uh, happening, and and it's really nice. Uh, what uh, what I would like to su suggest that uh, um, uh, uh, distribution system operators should uh, uh, should communicate and learn. Uh, for example, this very nice uh, uh, things uh, we heard about uh, from from France, uh, and the same thing goes about uh, policymakers. One a special detail I I, I also want to. Uh, uh, to, to rea react on is the social dimension. Uh, social um, uh, instruments for vulnerable vulnerable consumers, uh, uh, I think they're, they, from member state to, to member state, they uh, uh, sometimes work, sometimes do not work enough. Sometimes uh, policy makers are um, uh, issuing some general policies, for example, uh, regarding all the household consumers for real costs from network and so on, uh, uh, do not uh, uh, the, uh, too much do on, on uh, targeting a special support. With communi uh, energy communities, self-consumption coming uh, uh, additional to the table to existing problems, um, uh, social policies, uh, helping vulner vulnerable consumers, energy vul vulnerable consumers should be adjusted uh, much much speedier. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, it is really uh, important uh, to to do this uh, uh, by reforming a network. Network needs to be reformed since uh, um, uh, self generation is possible. Really, technology possible. Um, uh, few uh, decades ago, there are few people, crazy people, doing self consumption. Uh, but uh, today this is mainstream, it's uh, having an impact. And uh, so, uh, so it goes also an EU-wide regulation, EU-wide policies. Commission needs to uh, engage and uh, uh, look at the market trends, patterns much more closely, not only on uh, market design, which is 
good. I, I don't understand sometimes why too much on PPA focus uh, today. Uh, there are several things more important, more uh, on the field uh, and uh, uh, to be tackled by EU Commission. Pardis, uh, Gatis, and Baiba, please. Yes, thank you. Uh, indeed, very interesting experiences from different member states. Uh, I'm happy for that. Um, really, I see the technologies and innovations, I would say, because in France, the example of France is kind of innovation for other countries. I think they go um, much beyond uh, regulatory uh, regulation, what is possible in regulation. And I think I agree with Gatis that we need to uh, align more and we need to educate also regulation, regulators and also all these matters that is regarding the national, um, national countries. There are huge diversity, I must say, because you mentioned already something is possible in France which is not possible in Portugal, something is possible in, in Spain that is not possible in, in Portugal. For example, individual self-consumption, there are different models, for example. In some countries you can have a self-consumption with full injection. In some countries you can have a total self-consumption production that is uh, remains at local level. In some other countries it's not regulated, it's not even possible. So. So you see how many uh, the, the diverse landscape there are, and I'm not even talking about taxes, network charges, and many other things that for the citizens living on the cross board, for example, France and Germany, there are, there, are, there are, I mean, many differences. So I think we need to align on that, try to find a benchmark, at least reasonable benchmark, and not to have these very wide diversities. Regarding energy poverty, I, I heard from Cecilia, Miguel, and Sara, you mentioned energy poverty. So I, I understand that this topic is really crucial uh, in different member states. Also in Latvia, I can confirm that. Um, indeed, um, indeed uh, I would like to use this opportunity because 19th of July, uh, we are organizing an economic and social mm. committee conference dedicated specifically to the energy poverty and it will be conference organized under the Spanish uh, presidency. So everybody welcome for this event and, and we will be happy that you, are sh you can share your examples how to better tackle the energy poverty. I can tell you that some of the legislators at national level go one step further, not saying that energy poverty is a, is phenomenon that is applied to some social segment. Actually, we are talking about horizontal price increase. So it's not something that appears only for the one social group. So actually, we are using more concept uh, energy insufficiency, so that you cannot you cannot cover uh, or there are some temporary challenges or difficulties that people face. So I think with with time we will talk about something more general, not segmented to specific social groups. And, um, and uh, one of these groups also is tenants, because tenants are the blind spot of renewable energy policies, because tenants are not owners of the, uh, of the, of the sometimes apartments, sometimes house. So, uh, and in this case, they are kind of left behind. And this is, we are talking about 30% of inhabitants of EU. So, so actually, it's a large, uh, large uh, segment. So, so many, many issues I heard from you and uh, looking forward mm. to have a next step discussion in Energy Poverty Conference. Thank you, Pardis. Merci beaucoup. Molto obrigado. Muchas gracias. Don't forget energy for the citizen, with the citizen, by the citizen. Bonne fin de journée. Thanks a lot. Bye bye. <laughs>